Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm Asim Agarwala from Adobe Systems. Um, and we're going to start out with an invited talk. Um, it's going to be a little bit different than some of the talks you've seen already. Um, I'm really uh, excited and honored to introduce Jason Salavon. Jason Salavon is a fine artist uh, and a professor at the University of Chicago. I've really been a big fan of his work for years. And I know his work has come up in a lot of conversations and talks that involve computational photography. It's inspired a lot of work. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. Jason? Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, this is going to be, I think, a little bit of a different talk than you guys have uh, had so far. This is an artist talk. It'll be a little bit of an abbreviated version of an artist talk. Um, artist talks typically are, are a little more, maybe a little more biographical, span maybe a little more time. So I'll talk about projects that go back even 15 years. And I'll, while the, my work sort of spans um, maybe a broader space than just computational photography, I'll sort of try to focus the conversation here in that space a little bit more. Um, but just to sort of give a little bit of background, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dim the lights also. Okay. So this is a, a painting on a um, panel. Uh, it was maybe half that size, so, so certainly not that big. But um, this hung over my bed from like 1975 when I was five to uh, maybe the late 70s, like through Star Wars for sure. Um, <laughs> this is a painting my father made. So I grew up in, yeah, he made that. So I grew up in a, uh, like a, an artistic household. He was a, a, a practicing fine artist. Um, maybe a little bit of a hippie household, maybe some recreational activities. Of, they were hidden from me, but looking at this painting, I assume there were. Um, <laughs> And that, that sort of environment, maybe counterintuitively, I drew and painted a ton as a kid, but I actually was much more interested in uh, mathematics and science, um, early computing, and uh, maybe sports and other things. But that environment, while I was sort of steeped in it and, and learned a lot of art history and sort of firsthand knowledge of what being an artist, what that life might be like, um, it also sort of helped me find a different kind of path. I want to fast forward and talk about um, a project that I did in grad school. So this is from 96, and it's uh, four photographs printed uh, as cibachromes, uh, so through a lens in a dark room, um, about that size. Each photograph is, is pretty close to that size. The suite was called the Grand Unification Theory, uh, every second of, and then it was each film. So these are one frame per second of four entire films. So that's one frame per second of Star Wars, the aforementioned Star Wars. And the, I, was do, I was using a, an SGI Indy and writing in C to sample frames at a regular rate, one frame per second, and then um, rearrange them. And this is before uh, sort of photo mosaics broke big in the late 90s. So I sort of came to this through a different path. My interest was in maybe a little bit of an analytical and also sort of purely art abstraction, like uh, the arrangement of the frames is not based obviously on narrative, it's based on luminosity. So brightest frames in the center radiating out. Um, and I did this to four films, so this is every second of Snow White. <laughs> this is every second of It's a Wonderful Life. And this is every second of Deep Throat. <laughs> and in thinking about, and I think this is um, really important for an artist, the specific content. So when we're thinking about sort of algorithms and processes, I think from the artist's point of view, the specificity of choices, what we fill up those space of possibilities with, is the crucial thing. So it's not just any four films. For me, these were like, I thought of them as sort of pillars of genre film. I wanted to sort of cover these bases of uh, sort of Americana, 
and speak to you know the blockbuster film, a major sort of early animation, the family film, and uh, pornography. Um, and I wanted to sort of cover that space. And my hope was, my intuition was that the formal properties of each image, the the way each image would look, would vary sort of uh, maybe unexpectedly. So I wasn't anticipating that that It's a Wonderful Life would have such a sort of full spectrum of luminosities. And these things and other other things that I did. Uh, later, really sort of tuned me into the, to the idea that, the, that in certain films, uh, the director was really conscientious about this sort of like range and dynamic range of light uh, that, was, that was used. So this is the brightest of the brights to the darkest of the darks, whereas you know, Deep Third has a really different sort of intent with, with sort of distribution of light. Um, at the time, I was working as an artist and programmer for Viacom New Media uh, while I was going to grad school, and I worked on a Beavis and Butthead game, and I worked on uh, a bunch of Viacom properties, basically, and they, uh, and I was sort of faced with whether to sort of pursue that route in the game industry, which was really fun and and uh, viable, or sort of take a chance on uh, being a fine artist, and I was lucky that my uh, and my master's thesis show, so uh, artists who go to graduate programs do a thesis show. Um, I was fortunate that I had some opportunities that sort of snowballed from that. And I spent most of the 2000s uh, just working as an artist, supporting myself by uh, making work available to galleries and museums and collectors and things like that. Um, but my interest was, has always been in you know, the, studio, the studio we write software for pretty much everything we make. Um, and in sort of manipulating the bulk of this bulk of information in different sorts of ways. Um, and this is a piece around the same time, treating sort of stacks of frames in a different way. Uh, this, is, um, this piece is called The Class of 1967, and it's two large photographs. And this is The Class of 1988. And they're um, all the graduating uh, members of the high school class of my mother's high school class and my high school class. So these are all the men. And the prints are quite large. Um, and it's this real simple uh, mean, in this case, just taking the mean of all the frames. Um, this, is, this, this piece sort of predates layers in Photoshop and things like that. So we did, I did this all. Um, I think I did these on the SGIs as well. Uh, these are all the women from the class of 67. And, and this is in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, so in 67, it's still kind of conservative in Fort Worth. You can see like this ghost of, of new hairdos coming into fashion, right? <laughs> so there's some, you can actually look at sort of, you know, uh, anthropological and sort of, you know, statistical evidence of trend. Um, this is my graduating high school class, also in Fort Worth. Demographic shift, um, cultural changes, although, uh, the tux tops and these sort of drape things are identical, which is really bizarre. The women of 88. So the, these ideas were pretty much simultaneous, the idea of sort of taking a, a grouping of, of some class of frames and sort of arraying them in some interesting, meaningful way, for me at least, and then uh, sort of amalgamating them as means. Um, and again, this is sort of late 90s. Uh, another way, I'll, I'll play a little piece, uh, I won't stick just to photography. Um, so I got, I got very interested in, in sort of thinking about classes of cultural sort of objects and maybe this idea of, of combining and compressing. Uh, and I produced this as um, a song I sort of made right at the, the turn of the millennium. I'll just play it for you. Just play a little bit of it. <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to sing a song, song now that was uh, done by, was written and recorded by Mr. Paul McCartney of the famous Four Season Beatles, an English sort of rock and roll group. Limited. This is a good place to be.
so uh, this is the, the song of the century, and it's uh, many, you know, at the, at the end of the millennium, there were, we were sort of inundated by polls of this of the century, that of the century, and, and um, uh, many, many different polls actually identified yesterday as a song of the century, most played song on radio, most covered song. So I took 27 covers and, and basically sort of did a similar mean uh, on them. But the issue was they immediately sort of, if, if I registered them all from the beginning, which was sort of the way I'd initially treated it, um, you got pure cacophony. And, and so this sort of uh, uh, alignment point became really important. So I used the, the, that sort of first yesterday. All the songs come in at different points. All the songs, songs sort of begin to quickly um, fall out of sync, but there's this moment uh, where they're together. And I thought that was a really nice sort of way of... of um, they're talking about the, the turn of the century and about our sort of desire to rank and, and those sorts of things. One of the other things about this, I didn't play it all the way through, it's you have different, there's a um, kind of cacophony that builds, but you still have really interesting moments where there's a moment where Marvin Gaye's voice really rises above everybody else, and it's this sort of beautiful tone, and there's a sort of... Um, antithesis moment where Michael Bolton's voice rises up over everyone else and it's quite painful. Um, <laughs> this, there's a sort of a uh, 20th century sort of exploration in setting up systems in art, this is in art, setting up systems and letting them sort of play out and sort of accepting sort of the consequences. John Cage is a composer who's sort of very well known for articulating uh, uh, this approach. And I think uh, computation really enables this even to another degree uh, that we can set up processes and systems, um, really tune them, tune the system, and then let it play out. Uh, it's what I seek to do in a lot of the things I do. Um, this is early 2000s. Uh, it's a large print, um, photographic print. It's called the top grossing film of all time, one by one. And it's uh, composed of, of about 350,000 little sort of pixel elements. Um, you see those sort of here. So this is every frame of the film Titanic, um, simplified to sort of a mean across the field, uh, across the frame. And then in this case, just arranged um, uh, in sequence from the beginning of the film to the end of the film. Right, so we have none of the actual content of the film except for the sort of residual uh, averaging per frame, and uh, yet you still have uh, a lot of evidence of the of the narrative itself. So, you know, this is this whole little sequence here is uh, Leo on the bow of the boat, I'm king of the world, right, and then um, this is where the ship goes down. And that, that this thing exists as sort of an abstract entity and then sort of, sort of is still sort of so connected to its source material is one of the things I'm really interested in, this transformation through process. Um, and again, these were, I think these, these, some of these ideas are being explored uh, more, uh, more broadly now, but at, uh, at that moment, um, there wasn't too much. A, uh, sort of another branch, my work sort of takes different branches and I think the one way to sort of think about the bulk of the work is um, uh, in thinking about classes of things and instances in, the, in those classes and the relationship between groups of, of individuals um, uh, and the individual sort of unique identity within those groups. I think most of my work tends to, tends to um, interrogate, you might, might say, some of those questions. Um, this is a branch that sort of uh, is about sort of pure visualization, pure data visualization. This is also a project from the early 2000s. Um, it's four prints and a video that um, graphically represent the uh, uh, domestic production of shoes in the U.S. from 1960 to uh, about 2000. And I was, I was, I came to this project with the intent, sort of out front, uh, to sort of take a dull data set, like a dull but complete data set, and sort of render it as a psychedelic, right? Or render it sort of in a special effects kind of manner. So it's just sort of 
sort of ironic idea about taking, you know, the banal and, and sort of imbuing it with, um, you know, graphic sort of uh, uh, power and, and interest and legibility. And um, so a couple things sort of come out of this. One is that I have been corrected by, especially the ladies, many times that shoes are not banal. So I totally, I have that, that I understand. Um, the other thing is, is, I did not come at this with any sort of uh, political intent or social intent, if I'm being sort of frank. Um, the shape of the thing is sort of a mountain volcano sort of shape. Let me play a little bit of the video. Three-dimensional graph in Maya, um, I think using Python or Mel to lay out the, the points. So, as I said, I was really, uh, I wanted it to be a clinical graph, but I wanted all the choices I could make to be about sort of this optical psychedelic sort of thing. Um, but the reason that that shape is uh, sort of this peak is that uh, down here is the 60s and here is now, or 2000. So that sort of narrowing is a really clear sort of visual of the lack of a um, manufacturing base in the U.S. So sort of this becomes a graph of outsourcing without even my intention. Um, and it, it was a surprise, a kind of a happy surprise, but one of these interesting things that, you know, even if you sort of really try to squeeze data, you, if, you, if you're sort of consistent, you might get sort of uh, so, some bit of truth kind of no matter what you do. Um, it's an interesting sort of experience. Let's hit on these. This is maybe somewhat, uh, some people here might know these works. Um, this is every Playboy centerfold from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, and I broke them into decades because I was really interested in hopefully illuminating some change in the way uh, uh, these photographs are, are shot. Um, so in the 60s, uh, this sort of, all of this is hair uh, where the model isn't directly looking at the camera but sort of more demurely looking away. You can almost sort of think of these as animating over time until you get to the 90s where you have sort of full frontal, everything faced in the right direction, I guess. Um, highlighting, it's much more lit. Uh, um, so that, that sort of, and then they also exist as these amorphous sort of uh, impressionistic forms, which is, uh, I don't know, this audience might be interested in this. I keep having these thoughts about Impressionist painting and what Impressionist painting really was about, or at least one aspect of it, was a response to sort of oncoming photography and that artists were sort of freed up to be more, to, to explore abstraction more, and the, one of the first branches into that was sort of an Impressionistic approach. And that these sort of mean, means of sets would have some resemblance to um, Impressionistic, I mean, you know, the impressionistic approach to abstraction is an interesting coincidence, and I, and I kind of I, I think about is it coincidental or is there something else going on there? Um, just especially in regard to like these projects, these are homes for sale in different regions in the U.S. at the sort of median price range. This is Seattle. No editing either. Like I, I'm really I, I I did not make an effort to make Seattle look this way. Um, I'm going to move ahead a little bit here. Um, I'm going to get up to sort of more present work. Uh, this is a, a, a 40 foot wall, sort of hanging cantilever wall. Uh, we installed it the, in the lobby of the new U.S. Census uh, Bureau headquarters uh, two years ago. It's static, it's just a single image. Um, it's an associated real-time multi-touch element we'll be installing this summer um, out of frame over here. Um, it's another view of it. This is similar to the shoes piece in that I was interested in sort of graphing the US population from 1790 to present uh, in a way that sort of uh, was not about teaching census about their data. I think census is uh, one of the most talented and interesting um, 
data gathering organizations uh, we have. Uh, so rather than that, I was about actually trying to amplify the aesthetic, to think about a data set as like a formal thing. You know, artists have painted trees and painted landscapes, and you can start to think about like a complex data set as having sort of formal properties um, like that can be visualized in, in ways that are maybe about sort of um, the aesthetic experience of the thing. Uh, so this is the, and just to show you sort of how I did that in this case, um, this is a sort of digital version of, of the one view of the data set I chose. So the real-time element will have sort of an interactive, you'll be able to explore this uh, really deeply. But just to sort of show how I got to this, so here's the population of Cook County, where I live, uh, from 1790 to present. Here's the population of the 3,100 U.S. counties, all, all the different population curves. Um, here they are color-coded. And I was using sort of state flag information as a way of sort of, a di of assigning color to each county. And then some three-dimensional transformations and we have sort of a final 3D object. So I, I, I work as a composer. It's where we're composing with data and I get, how you, you can remain truthful. I mean, there are an infinite number of choices one could make about how to visualize this data set, 3,000 counties over, over 200 years. You know, this is one of the ones I chose. I actually chose quite a few. And, and the, again, I talked about specificity. For artists, I think it's about sort of taking the chance on the specific choice and going, okay, this is the winner. This is, and I mean, I have thousands of these sorts of views. And I had to sort of go with a little bit with my gut, like this is the one I'm choosing. Um, but again, I am interested in the breadth of the, of the thing, so that's, that's why this sort of interactive element will be there too. As far as the sort of, this is a, these use the mean and the median combined. Um, I only did that for a little bit of more crunchy character. Um, I think these are the last of the sort of amalgamation works that I'm going to do, and they, they're, uh, Old master paintings. It's uh, most all I could find from the ooves, ooves like all the, the portraits that these guys have made of Franz Halls and Van Dyck, uh, Velasquez, Diego Velasquez, and uh, uh, Rembrandt. Um, and I was interested in both the sort of commonalities we would find and the variety. Um, and I also thought that they'd be these really sort of warm, handsome sort of objects. Uh, this is the the halls. Um, this might be of interest to you, the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York will be doing a show called After Photoshop in their, in their contemporary photography galleries. This will be included in that show, but it just goes to show that sort of even a staid institution like the Met is sort of finding a way uh, to, to get engaged with and think about sort of uh, what I would call computational photography in maybe a, a sort of broader artistic sense. So it's, it's it's interesting, though, the art world is slow sometimes to catch up, but um, I think they, they're aware now, the fine art world is sort of aware of the, both the importance and the sort of broad capabilities and, and, and sort of vista, uh, vistas of new work that, that will be created in the future. Uh, the art world sort of waking up to that. So I want to show one last piece, and I'll be happy to um, answer questions. I just had an exhibition open two weeks ago, and I haven't shown this work anywhere but at that exhibition, and I'll just show one of the pieces from the show. Um, this is called Good and Evil 2012, um, and it's, uh, I've, I've gotten really interested in search, and I've skipped over some of the work, but I've done some work with my own, like making public my own search history of 20,000 search items over the last like four years, which is an interesting way to think about a self-portrait. Um, there was a really nice study uh, done last year quantifying the sort of most positive words in the English language to the most negative words in the English language, 10,000 words. Um, I took uh, the, the top and bottom 100 and basically made image search sort of, I hate the word photo mosaic, but I'm, I'm tiling uh, 25,000 images per panel, and I'll show you the, the word list. So, you know, the good words, you know, laughter and happiness and, you know, sunlight and sweetheart. And then the evil words, the bad, the negative words are terrorist and 
uh, murder and suicide and bankruptcy and and it's very, I think it's very, the reason I titled it 2012, these, these words, I think, change culturally over time. But I was thinking about a semantic gradient, right? We have this, what does search do with those words, and are there patterns that come back? I think there are in some sense. So here's the good panel. So this is, you know, uh, very high resolution print. It's, a, it's a over six foot tall. Um, let me show you. And the words are sort of arranged in, you see this sort of rays, these sort of little pie rays. So it's a, basically a pie chart. Um, so this is sky. You can see that here. Um, the evil panel. And uh, sort of see some details here. Um, I actually had to use Bing rather than Google, which would, might surprise you guys. The Google API caps, down, caps image uh, acquisition at 64, whereas Bing is quite generous. Uh, counterintuitive, but true. Um, and the, the, I found the, um, actually, and I found the overlap to be, I mean, this is sort of subjective. I didn't do a real analysis, but in the territory of uh, sort of 50% overlap, the, the engines, return, of, subjectively speaking, of basically the same flavor of set with a lot of actual, you know, high degree of actual uh, overlap, um, which got me thinking about who works at these places and what, you know, how are they coming up with their, their algorithms. Um, and then on these, these little monitors is actually over, say, four hours, all you know, 25,000 images per panel uh, is playing, and the the evil panel is actually quite difficult. We actually had to hang a uh, parental advisory. There are, and as you guys know I me, mean, I'm interested in the weirdness of the internet, that there is such gross and disgusting stuff in this image. Um, and it, it, so I'm thinking more and more about how to sort of deal with this, this idea of a gradient. Um, a simpler piece, and I'll show you one last piece, that'll be done, um, is a similar kind of approach with search but I'm just trying to recreate the sort of standard color wheel. So this is blue, blue, green. So these are search terms. All the, you know, uh, I think it's a thousand images coming back for blue, for blue, green, for green, all the way around the color wheel. With all kinds of oddities, including uh, over here is blue, violet, um, and violet blue is an adult actress. So my color, my color wheel gets completely sort of uh, nullified with the interruption of flesh tone in here. <laughs> and that, this sort of like collision of, of semantic sort of truth and expectation and what the net does with these things was my hope. Like I was interested. It was quite like, you know, this is what I wanted something like this to happen. I was, I was sort of looking for that. Um, so those are brand new pieces. and. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop there, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys might have. I'll bring up the lights while we're at it. Any questions? How long does it take you to make one of these? Uh, the, those last two were pretty labor intensive. We wrote a server to download all the search terms. We, uh, the thing was sort of built with Python and Maya and rendered in Maya. There's a lot of layers, but um, in, in this case, like, I feel I've got some tools I'm going to use in future work that I'm really excited about. It can, it can d d depend on the pieces, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I have a class right now uh, called Data and Algorithm in Art that's five uh, advanced CS students and six art students, basically. Basically. Um, and I think three of the, I've got three CS seniors. One's going to Utah to do his PhD in visualization next year. So I've got these fantastic programmers and some artists that have never done a thing. And I think it's an interesting combination where 
my interest is in sort of, how should I say this, loosening the programmers up a little bit and in uh, teaching uh, the artists a little bit of rigorous craft and technique. And they're working collaborative progress. That's one of the things we've sort of come to is like these, these guys need to work together. Um, but it's been really interesting. I think I, I stressed it a couple times in the talk. I'm really interested in talking about it's wonderful to come up with this uh, fantastic new sort of general purpose technology. Um, who's going to be the person to sort of make use of it and do something interesting with it? And, you know, I think that's the conversation between artists and technologists. How do we sort of come together on, on really interesting, innovative ways to use interesting, innovative technology? Um, I guess for, for my practice, I'm just interested in bandwidth and resolution. Like, those are the things I want the most. I want, like, walk-in experiences, right? I want walk-in, super high-res, um, real-time experiences. Uh, so I'm kind of, and it may be a generational thing, I'm, I'm interested in, you know. So I didn't show much of it, but I've gotten really interested in real-time stuff, calling from the net, and, and I have a weird aggregator that I just sort of made as an artwork. Um, so, you know, like real-time 3D and uh, super high res, those are the kinds of spaces I think I'm interested in, sort of on a personal level. Uh, Yeah, I actually have the same sort of questions. Um, my hope is that it's, and this almost contradicts what I just said in some way, but my hope is that it's that developments in computational photography won't just be um, all about higher resolution versions of the same thing. You know, um, there, I would love to, 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 you know, have more conversations even about sort of transformative sort of non-intuitive ways to sort of crack that egg. Um, I don't know the answer, but I do, I do, I do feel like I'm not that interested in, in this is again, per, like real personal, I'm not that interested in like more snapshots that are bigger and better or whatever, you know. But that's like a personal thing, like I don't have a Flickr account, it's not my sort of, like people think I'm, I'm in, I'm in photo collections and museums, but I barely shoot pictures. It's not, it's just not how I'm sort of wired. So I come at it from a more sort of analytical and maybe more painterly approach. I think I'm more informed by the history of painting actually in, in many ways. Um, I guess it's sort of an answer. A lot of things are happening, partly from this research community, but in general, is uh, the, the bar of entry for making things that are like art from photos or digital artifacts is going down. Yes. So there's you know, this good process of making creative tools easier, but there's a certain point of, is it too easy? Or are we you know, removing the artistic element by adding so much automation? I was just wondering, there's no real obvious answer in there but no I think it's a I think it's a great question and it's like it's sort of near and dear to me I know I know exactly what you're talking about um, I think it's so for interesting artists especially young artists their job is to stay out front like and they will get swallowed you know it will happen and you'll get sort of you know the bar will be that will happen um, it's good for me like it makes me this is this is a stupid sort of thing, but you know, this, this, you know how Madonna like changed her style every time everybody else jumped on board when she was actually like relevant. Um, sorry, um, that's the sort of like I'm leaving things behind really conscientiously because I feel like a crowd 
sort of in a space, and I think researchers do some of the, some researchers do the same sorts of things. Um, artists particularly, I think, are oriented that way. I say it's great, like make these things, it, it will make them, it will make things that once were sort of maybe almost incredible into tchotchkes is the problem, but that's like, that's not really the technologist's problem, that's sort of the nature of things, I think. Uh, but it is, it's a, it's a great question, it's something I do th spend a little bit of calories thinking about. Okay? Thank you, guys. That was really cool. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. So, uh, my name is Yair Poleg, and uh, I'm going to talk about alignment and mosaicing of non overlapping images. This is a joint work with uh, Professor Shmuel Peleg from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So, we'll begin with a quick. Uh, right. A quick uh, overview of uh, mosaicing. So we have a set of uh, we have a set of uh, overlapping images, and we would like to align them and stitch them together and, and to create this uh, single panoramic image. <coughs> now the uh, method of alignment depends on the amount of overlap that we have between the images, right? So if we have a large overlap, like in this case, we can use either direct methods or feature-based methods uh, to align the images. And if we have smaller overlap between the images, we will probably use feature-based methods, uh, since uh, direct methods are less suitable for this case. Now, another case of uh, mosaicing is mosaicing of uh, contiguous images. In this case, the images do not overlap at all, but they are contiguous. And this, uh, this case is uh, you know, a recent uh, paper by Pumar et al. that deals with this case exactly. Now, we what we would like to do in our work is to deal with the case that the images do not overlap and they are not contiguous at all. And we would like to create a single panoramic image from non-overlapping images. I will now give uh, the method the outline. So uh, the input in our case is an unordered set of uh, non-overlapping images, like here at the bottom. And the first, uh, the first thing we need to do is to align these images and uh, since they do not overlap, they do not, don't have any shared features. And what we propose to do is to extrapolate the images, and by that, make them overlap, or hope to make them overlap. Then, we perform a multi-scale greedy search for the approximate alignment, and you can see here the result of uh, such an alignment uh, process. And once we got this alignment, we remove the extrapolated areas because we don't want them at the final panoramic image. And then we have these gaps in the image, right? And what we do actually is in-paint these gaps to get the final panoramic image. So this was the method outline, and we now go into details. So we begin with uh, image extrapolation. Uh, our goal is to make the images overlap. And there are a few related works in this field. I, I will mention two important works. The first one is by uh, Efros and Leong from the field of uh, textual synthesis. And as you can see here, they uh, show a way to extrapolate images. And the extrapolated area contain, contains the fine details, as you can see there on the right uh, uh, red marking. Now, we wouldn't like to have such fine details in the extrapolated areas because uh, they can damage the alignment process. <coughs> uh, another work uh, is from the field of video extrapolation. It, uh, it's of uh, Ida et al. It was presented here last year. And uh, as you can see, in the uh, red rectangle in the middle there, in the center of the image, is the original fr video frame. And the rest of the image is actually extrapolated uh, data. And this is more like the kind of extrapolation we'd like to have in our case in order to enable alignment of uh, non-overlapping images. So we basically follow their approach, and then we'll now uh, briefly describe the basic steps. So this is an uh, example-based image extrapolation method, and the basic step in uh, such methods are uh, extrapolation of a single patch, like A prime there. And uh, what we're going to do is to uh, look at the neighbor of A prime, and then search for the closest patch uh, uh, to this patch A. And once we found such a patch, we look at its neighbor and copy it into A prime. So this is how uh, we extrapolate a single patch, and of course we do it to all the patches we would like to extrapolate one by one. Now, uh, there is more to this uh, in order to get uh, a smooth and uh, large extrapolated areas, uh, a few more things you need to do. 
So what we actually do is uh, we create a Gaussian pyramid for all the input images, and then we look for the, extrapolate for the matching patches across all images because uh, we assume they all come from the same scene, and it makes sense to look for uh, matching patches across all of them. And across all scales, uh, again, because we assume there are fractal elements in our world uh, which we could, uh, we, which we could uh, use in the extrapolation. Another thing is uh, that we average all the overlapping images, uh, the overlapping uh, patches, and uh, this is something that uh, contributes even more to the uh, smoothness of the extrapolated area. And lastly, we perform this in uh, multi-scale steps, as I describe next. So we begin with uh, the input image, and we downsample it. And the extrapolation actually begins at the chorus level. At that, uh, at that level, we extrapolate a band of k pixels around the uh, downsampled image. So here's the extrapolation. And then we want to propagate the result to the upper level. All right, so we take this band of k pixels, we magnify them, and attach them to the upper level. Now at this point, we re-extrapolate a band of k pixels around uh, this at this level. And we repeat this process until we get to the original image resolution. And again, re-extrapolate. All right, so let's see some uh, results. Uh, so you can see uh, the yellow markers uh, mark the width of the extrapolated area. And of course, uh, we have some uh, bad effects from time to time. And as you can see here, uh, we have uh, an hallucination of, hallucination of a complete structure, uh, which creates a, period, a periodic pattern, and uh, such effects can uh, damage the alignment process and we would like to avoid them. This one specifically happened because we used uh, large patches in the search process. Okay, so now that we got uh, these uh, extrapolated images and we hope uh, they overlap, we need to align them. And the first thing we try to do is to align them using state-of-the-art tools like uh, Microsoft Image Composition Editor and Photosynth and Adobe Photo Merge. Now, these are really great tools and I'm using them all the time, all the time. And they produce amazing results, but they fail to align these images. And uh, the reason uh, we guessed they failed is because they probably use uh, feature-based methods to align these images. And clearly, we don't have any features in uh, the extrapolated areas. Uh, at this point, we decided to go back to the basics and try a direct greedy method uh, that works in a cost to find manner in order to align the images. So we begin with a simple case uh, where we have two images. And we define the alignment cost to be the sum of the uh, LAB differences uh, between the, in the overlap area. Uh, with th uh, three minor changes, we give lower weight to the L channel to uh, account for illumination changes and we penalize smooth areas because we would like to maintain the, the general structure of the scene. And lastly, we normalize the, the cost by the area of the overlap in order to uh, prevent uh, preference uh, for small overlaps. So once we got this cost, we basically uh, evaluate this cost at every relative shift and uh, choose the uh, shift that minimizes this uh, cost. Now, if we have uh, more than uh, two images, uh, then we define the global cost to be the sum of pairwise alignment cost I presented earlier. And we have a problem because uh, the exhaustive search in this case is uh, much too expensive. And uh, this is where the iterative uh, greedy search comes in. And what we actually do is uh, we begin by piling up all the images on top of each other. And at this uh, arrangement of the images we evaluate the global cost, and this is the initial cost we use uh, for the alignment process. Then at, at uh, each iteration, we try to minimize the global cost by translating a single image. So for example, at the first iteration, we found that uh, moving that image to the left uh, reduces the global cost. And in the next iteration, moving that image to the right reduces the global cost. And if we cannot reduce the cost any further, then we stop. Um, the key observation here is that uh, translations to the correct direction usually give the best minimization. All right, so let's see an example for uh, such a process. So here is alignment of three images in a single scale, and you can see the images slide to their, uh, their approximately correct location. And here is another example, uh, this time in a multi-scale multi setup, starting from the chorus level, the lowest, uh, lowest scale. Again, you can see the images slide to their correct location, approximately correct location. And this is the uh, original image uh, resolution. All right, so, so far we uh, assume pure translation between the images, 
uh, and of course if we have uh, rotations, uh, we would like to deal with them as well. So if we have small rotations, uh, basically we can ignore them. And the reason we can ignore them is that uh, the in-painting step at the end of the process uh, conceals uh, these rotations. And simply we can uh, forget about them. Uh, but if we have uh, more significant rotations, uh, we would like to uh, uh, handle it somehow. And the th we wouldn't like to add the rotation to the grid research because uh, it increases the complexity quite significant significantly. So what we propose to do is create a sort of a rotation variant uh, images and then try to work with them. And this is what I'm going to describe next. So suppose uh, we have these two nice uh, input images. And you see the right one is uh, rotated uh, just a bit. Uh, what we do is we create, uh, uh, we create rotated copies of these uh, input images and we simply uh, integrate them by averaging their color values into uh, blended, uh, we call them integrated images. And then we try to find the alignment uh, over these images in the same method I described earlier. Right? So this is the uh, alignment. Actually, it's only the translation between the images. And this is the, uh, the translation we found between the images. And at this point, what we're trying to do is to find the right rotation between these uh, images. So we're looking for the best match among the rotated uh, copies of the images. And uh, this, is a, this is the result. So here is a real world example. These are the input images. And you see the right uh, image is uh, rotated by 15 degrees approximately. Here are the, the, these are the input images after extrapolation. Integrated images uh, created from 21 copies uh, of rotated uh, uh, images. The translation we found between the integrated images and the final result, which is approximately correct. Another example with the three images. So these are the input images after the extrapolation. The integrated images, this time created from uh, five rotated copies. The translations we found between the images. And the result. OK, uh, of course, we have some drawbacks. Uh, the main drawback is uh, that this is a greedy algorithm, and of course, it can converge to a local minimum, and we can't help it, really. And the second major drawback is that we are quite limited with these uh, rotation things. Uh, we experimented, uh, experimented with up to 21 uh, different rotations, two degrees each. And more than that, the alignment uh, process uh, quite failed. Now to the last step uh, in our method, uh, when we complete the alignment process, we remove the extrapolated areas because we don't want them in the final uh, panorama. And so uh, we have these gaps in the image and we use uh, in-painting methods uh, to fill in these gaps. We, we tried the shift map and content aware fill of uh, Adobe. And they both uh, uh, produce very nice results. So let's see some examples. These are the input images after the alignment and after removing the extrapolated areas. And this is after in-painting. And another one. This is the uh, input, uh, input images after alignment and after removing the extrapolated images. And this is uh, after in-painting. And for this one, we also have ground truth. And this is the ground truth. So you can see that in the uh, vertical axis, we are uh, quite right in the alignment. And in the horizontal uh, axis, uh, it's approximately right, correct. OK, so just uh, let's sum up. Well, we saw how to uh, basically we can uh, align and mosaic non-overlapping images. We have uh, three simple steps. Uh, the first one is image extrapolation. Uh, in that step, we make the images overlap. The second one is uh, multi-image alignment. Uh, we presented the method, uh, a greedy method, uh, to uh, perform this. And the last one is simply in-painting of the gaps between the images. And this is it. Thank you.
Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. What happens what, if what? Oh, um, basically, hmm. I suppose it, it will have some trouble in the alignment process. So we had uh, the reason we, went, we switched to LAB was because we had a uh, problem with the illumination changes, and uh, reducing the weight of the L channel uh, quite uh, handled it uh, right. It's not perfect, but it's working fine. Does this answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yes, please. When you do the painting in a gas, do you find the up edge of the light and then or just a uh, Okay, so we use the in painting just as a black box. Um, and uh, for example, in shift map, uh, it takes, uh, you can define the neighborhood from which it takes the, the patches. It's not texture, it's actually a single pixel in shift map. And uh, so we basically didn't play with it at all. Just uh, use it as a black box. Yes, please. Um, user can place uh, the input images roughly and I would change your no. optimization? No. You throw, at, uh, throw the images, we extrapolate them and try to align them. No user interaction. No, what time. I'm saying is uh, instead of you trying to completely automatically create a pattern. Come again? Uh, instead of trying to completely automatically Oh, well, we actually, we actually started, uh, <laughs> this is a funny story, we actually, uh, we didn't know how to uh, do this uh, multi-image alignment. And so we, we started by uh, having a good guess of the approximate alignment and then to converge. And then this uh, one time we just uh, tried to put them, uh, stack them up on top of each other, the images, and we saw that it converges anyway. So we stayed <laughs> with this uh, method. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hansin, for the introduction. So um, today's talk is about a contrast preserving document uh, decolorization. It's, uh, um, this topic is about the grayscale images. So actually, um, why do we do this project? Actually, uh, if we look at um, modern printing, actually, we still use a lot of bright and white printing. And because it's fast and uh, with low cost and the possibility is very more friendly. So um, I don't know you, but 99% uh, of my printing is on uh, using black and white printer. Um, so, but recently we can find that more and more documents are uh, in color. So especially for the researchers in communication, computer graphics, and uh, computational photography, we have a lot of, um, we have all our papers mostly containing um, color figures, illustrations, and I think uh, possibly in uh, this ICCP, our paper is the one with the most grayscale figures, looks outdated. So um, actually, there's one problem, um, knowing for a pretty long time, we're printing some image or some illustration using black and white printer, so we see um, sometimes we don't get what we want. For example, if you have such a rectangle in this color image, you don't see it clearly in the printout. So, so we uh, devote ourselves to this problem and uh, this question from the answer today, fortunately. So uh, we can improve the result and uh, let you have a better uh, black-white printing. So is this a special case or is just a general case? To show that, actually, I can tell you this image is not a a uh, special image. So we just browse the, um, the papers and we find just one figure in the one paper uh, published in this SCP. So I think the author can thank me later. <laughs> the, there's another one uh, I can show here. So this is very good illustration, showing you that there's a, a red rectangle enclosing a blurred character, trying to tell us some information. It's, very, very, um, it's a very smart way to do that, but uh, um, what do we get from a, a HP printer? It's just a, um, like a, the, 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 black, the rectangle totally, get totally lost. So it's not obvious at least. Um, so this is another example actually from another paper uh, present in this ICCP. So we have uh, um, more examples. Actually, it's not a 
from our papers. This is uh, a very complicated table, and uh, I think this is very smart to use different color to highlight different regions. And uh, so the information is pretty clear in the color version. But if we print out using our print, HP printer, uh, we find there's no, no difference. So uh, this is not really what we want. Why it happens, I think, is because the, although the chrominance between two colors, like uh, the pink and green, uh, are quite de different, but uh, actually the brightness or lightness are really similar. So that is the main cause of the problem. So um, I don't think I need to show you more examples to tell you how important this problem is. Uh, but uh, actually, this is really a problem that I've uh, known for a pretty long time. So finally, I got an answer here. And uh, this is the, um, so you don't need to refer into the original color image to know what happened. And uh, so this system gives you automatic method to find out what, the, what is the best partition or what is best color assignment. And uh, there's no, there's guarantee no art video artifact can be produced in this process. Um, so let's formally define the problem. So this problem actually is called the decolorization. It's trying to find a, um, it's trying to give in an input of color image with three channels. It tries to find only one image representation with one channel. And this channel should contain as many as um, information as possible. Also, in the meantime, we hope that there is no visual artifact. So this is the, um, the goal in this process. Um, this problem looks very, very easy, actually. You may think it's kind of intuitive. It's uh, straightforward, but uh, actually we find it's not. There's uh, uh, many issues in this process. Um, so this is a very typical example. Um, of course, it's a main-made example, but uh, I think it's uh, it has traced uh, here in the problem. So we have uh, different colors. For example, is is there are two different regions? So this one we map it to a grayscale. So we get this. So for the other region, we also need to map them to the grayscale. So we get the mapping process, and this is the result we get. So uh, based on this mapping process, we are able to get the result. So it's totally unacceptable. So it's not a uh, so that's the inherent problems in decolorization. So there, um, there is previous work, and um, there are local methods trying to have to tackle this problem using um, a two-layer methods. For example, if you have uh, this input, you can um, naively produce a grayscale image by naive mapping. So it gives you a result that is not uh, good enough, but uh, it's okay because they also has a color contrast map, which is the enhanced version um, 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 mainly on the edges. So the final result will be the combination of the two layers, and it looks better than the naive mapping. But this process can give you some results, may, you may think have a halloing artifact. So um, they are work trying to address this issue and uh, trying to improve the problem, so they're called global methods. So these methods, trying to find the only mapping from color to grayscale um, regardless the position of the color. So this is called a go mapping. So the process is just finding the mapping uh, one by one, and eventually it gives you a mapping. It's defined globally for the whole image. And but uh, I, I need to uh, note here that actually the previous using global methods gives you, has one major problem that in Almost all global methods, the color order is strictly satisfied. So what is color order? Let me just uh, see example. I'll show you one example. Here we have two color. One is red, one is green. So can you tell me which one is brighter, which one is darker? So I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy. Why? Because if we, uh, we can have a very simple uh, experiment. If we put these two colors in YUV space, we found actually the brightness of the red is smaller than the brightness of the green. But if we put it into LAB space, we get the contradictive conclusion that the lightness of the red is smaller, is larger than the lightness of the green. So which one we should obey or we, which one, which solution we should adopt? So that is the question. So also there are some, actually this is not a um, unique phenomenon. Actually we have found a, proof or support from the psychology area. There has been study showing that the order of different colors cannot be defined uniquely by people. 
And uh, there's also conclusion that people with different culture and language background have different senses of brightness with respect to color. So, it's, uh, so this tells us actually it's not easy to define color orders for some colors, but not all of them. So, it's, uh, so this is the, our, um, this is primarily our foundation to construct a new system to make the um, decolorizing process fully automatic and uh, uh, conscious preserving. Um, so because of this color order, uh, some color orders are ambiguous. So we, if we still enforce the color order constraint on these ambiguous colors, so what do we get? So this is the comparison. So now given the input, so we human, so we can see clearly uh, the difference between the red and uh, the blue sky. And so there's, there's very, very obvious there's difference, but uh, in all previous global methods, this kind of contrast becomes weakened. And if we look at this information within those rectangles, we find actually if we can um, telling you these are actually totally different colors, you should preserve more contrast comparing to, um, comparing to the prism methods only preserve part of them. So, uh, so our contribution actually is threefold in this work. So we try to relax the color order constraint. So we had uh, proposed a uh, bimodal contrast preserving model. And also for this unambiguous color pairs, we introduce the weak color order. And this is very, very important and useful in this decolorizing process. And also to make the problem solvable efficiently. So we change from global mapping to the uh, polynomial mapping. So this is uh, another contribution in this work. So let me just uh, begin with the uh, first ob object function. So what is the object function? Basically, the decoration process in trying to make the grayscale contrast the same as that in the color image. So given that you have two color pixel X and Y, so we hope that the grayscale contrast, the GXY, is very similar to the color contrast in CIE lab distance. So this is a very intuitive interpretation. And uh, so we make it, to make this claim not that strong, so we make it a Gaussian distribution. And so basically, the distribution follows a Gaussian. And uh, this tells you, uh, actually, so this, is, this, no, um, this is a very simple model, and uh, we may adopt it. So we may see it for many papers. And based on it, so the traditional way, traditional methods actually not only enforce the magnitude similarity, at the same time, they're also requiring that the order are the same. The orders are the same. So that means if the color order is positive, then the grayscale order should be also positive. So this is traditional methods. We found that this is not proper or correct for those um, ambiguous p uh, color pairs. So instead, we introduce a bimodal distribution to give a better interpretation of this whole process. So we allow that the distribution follow a bimodal pigs. So they, 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 so it's allowed that one pixel, the so one um, contrast for, for the grayscale pixels for in left or right, but uh, for the traditional method, there's only one choice. You have to make it left or right. So this small change actually make a big difference. I will show you later. So this is uh, uh, based on this information. So we found is we also trying to find out whether all pixel um, color pairs are ambiguous or not. We found it's not. Actually, there are am ambiguous color pairs. So how to define it? So we define it in a very simple way. So in all three color channels, if the values is larger than those values in, in for the other pixel, for the other color, so we say this is not uh, uh, this is not ambiguous. So I, I can show you a few examples. So you can, you can clearly see that actually the right color is, should be brighter than the left one. So there's no ambiguity. So this color actually are ambiguous color pairs. And this is another few examples. So based on it, we try to incorporate two situations. One is ambiguous color pairs. The other case is the unambiguous color pairs. Then we introduce the alpha, which is a balanced weight. So this weight can be 1.0 uh, 1 or 0 0.5. So it's depending on whether you define it as ambiguous or not. 
And then we change our traditional bimodal distribution a little bit, so we copy this alpha into. So for every color, for every pixel, you actually have choice. You can choose it as one modal or bimodal distribution. It's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the system decision or your decision. So finally, to make the problem solvable, I can show you that this direct solve this function is not easy or it's not efficient. So, um, so what a problem it is. So actually, if we try to solve for all the grayscale image G, actually, uh, this involves a lot of variables. So one, every pixel is a, is, a, is a variable, so it's very large. For example, for this simple, even for this very small, um, uh, uh, this very, very simple image, we can see there contain, it contains around 100,000 pixels of variables. So it's not, it's not, it's, that's really um, too much because it can easily make the result stuck in the local minimum or it can give you a very, very slow process to give the result. So it's not acceptable. So we try to improve the process try, uh, by introducing a parametric global color to grayscale mapping. So this mapping actually is defined as global mapping again, but we, instead of have a pixel-wise mapping, we introduce an omega-based parametric mapping. So, so the search space will be much, much smaller. Um, so what is, the, what is the suitable parametric model for color to grayscale? So this is another problem. Um, we actually define one way to, to give you the parametric model which is very, very effective and also is simple. So this is called a, a polynomial mapping function. So what is polynomial function? Actually, it contains a few monomial terms in, and these monomial terms will be summed up um, giving the weight of omega in this whole process. And so we can constrain the order of the polynomial. If the monomial order is two, so actually we are able to give you a order two or quadratic uh, polynomial. And so there are only nine channels, color channels can be combined. So if we look at these line color channels, they are, they are not linear. Actually, they are actually nonlinear process to give you more information or new information in the original color space. So, um, so how, how, how could this be usable? So let me show you another example. Here is color uh, image. So this color image can be actually decomposed into RGB, so it's, very, it's widely known, and there's no, there's no uh, ambiguity, there's no doubt about it. But uh, actually, we can give a better interpretation. So we try to can decompose it into a polynomial composition of RGB channels defined by and constrained by the order of this uh, combination. And, uh, in this, in this process, actually, we can show you different images. So this, different, this image can be computed quickly um, without taking any computation time. And so given that these nine channels, we are able to combine them together. So, uh, so the, only, the only freedom is on the omega now. So you are able to choose any omega to give you different results. But our optimization gives you the one um, that is most suitable or in terms of your object function. So this is the final result if we can optimize the whole process and we are able to give you grayscale image. And this image is, uh, is, is, is different from the previous one, but uh, this one actually is the one um, suit most the original color image and maintains all the contrast and the differences and structures. And also I, I, I should tell you that actually this simple combination of different color channels is a generalization of all previous grayscale mapping. So what does it mean? It means in, in, in previous, we can define as lightness, we can define intensity, we can define brightness, but all of them are special cases in this combination. So this is a fairly usable uh, generalization of traditional way to combine color channels. Now, based on this information, we actually we change our model a little bit, uh, changing it from pixel-wise computation to a parametric-based um, model computation. And uh, so we only need to change the, the grayscale contrast and uh, make it like defined in a, controlled by the omega. And then the final object function is still the same. They are, there's no change on the final object function. Then how can we solve it? So we propose a method to quickly solve it, and it's very simple. Um, we simply, because we maximize this object function equivalent to take the, uh, minimizing the uh, negative logarithm of this object function, then we define it as an energy function, then um, we, we, it's very natural that we can take a um, gradient, take a further derivative and set them to zero. Now, because of this, we can get expansion. 
So this expansion gives you a set of um, equations. And uh, there, note that in this equation, there's one uh, strange variable, which is called a beta. So what are, what, what are betas? Actually, beta is defined. Um, in, in, it has a closed form representation. It's, a, it's another expression. Because of this two representation, actually, we are able to have an iterative optimization process now. So firstly, we initialize the omega, so you can randomly assign omega anyway, so this is kind of, uh, um, so our algorithm is not sensitive to initialization. And then you, because of you have omega already, then you put it into your object function, and then you solve it, and you get a beta. So because once you get a beta, you go back to estimate the omega again, and this process just iterates, just uh, takes a few passes, and you get a result. And um, it's, it's a pretty easy. Why we can have a, such a, um, simple algorithm to optimize original object function, it is because the, um, the solution space is very small, because we only have nine parameters to estimate, or nine variables to estimate, so it's, it's very simple. So there's no, um, there's no much chance that the solution will be stuck in a very unreasonable local minima. So this is our observation in experiments. So we, we iterate a few times, we get a result. Um, here shows one example. Initially, we, we have a very simple initialization. So we say we let RGB share the same importance in the combination of the final grayscale image. That's the initialization. Then we start with uh, iteration one, then we get iteration two. Quickly, you find that the result improves. And uh, we, you, have, uh, you have the result containing more, higher, uh, more contrast and more prop contrast in, in the result. And also, you have uh, iteration three. You get another one. You find the result uh, further improves for five, uh, 13, 14, 15, so uh, it becomes stable and we stop. So it, it just need just uh, uh, 10, just like uh, 10 iterations, you stop. That, that's, that's enough in our experiments. Uh, here is the result, so, uh, so this is the input image and the output and this is previous work in global method trying to uh, produce a grayscale image from the color input. And uh, you, can, you can clearly see the difference. Uh, I don't think I need to explain too much here. And also you can see another comparison here. For this, this one, this exam actually is very difficult. Why? Because generally, traditionally, we regard, as, regard the blue and the red as the same color or the same intensity, the same brightness. Um, but uh, our algorithm tells you actually this, this is not necessary. So it's not necessary. We can, we can actually uh, give, uh, produce a very um, natural transition if we assign the two colors to two ends in the, in the grayscale um, range. And here's another one, so you have seen the result. i just show you the comparison here. And another one, so this one contains a lot of color patterns. These color patterns can be preserved better, um, much, much better in, the, in our result. And um, so we have kind of, so in this paper actually we propose a quantitative evaluation. So, and so because we don't hope to only let you see the result and compare the results, this is, may not be the best way for you to understand whether this algorithm works or not. So we have, we propose a, a ratio, so it's called the color contrast preserving ratio. So actually the definition is very simple. It is the, um, it is the ratio regarding the high contrast grayscale pixel over and uh, the, um, the number of pixels that, has, that have the high contrast color. So that is the, uh, the ratio definition. And based on this definition, you, I can show you one example. So this is input, and this is color scale. So you can get a large contrast gray color, color pixels. And this is the um, comparison with the um, large contrast color pixels and the large contrast gray scale pixels. And then you count the numbers, and then you get a ratio. So um, in terms of this ratio, I, I think our method can preserve more contrast. So that means the edges or, or even those structures, transitions can be preserved better in using our method. So we, you, can, you can change the tall, which is threshold, trying to determine we, what kind of method, or what kind of structure you regard as salient. So this is, uh, you can change tall, in, so this is a, a curve Y. And finally, I show you one application using this method. So um, traditionally, you, you, you have different ways to enhance the contrast of a color image. Now I give you another one. So, uh, of course, this is not proposed by us. It's an it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, application in previous um, color to grayscale uh, uh, papers. So, actually, this is, this, this is uh, the algorithm is very simple. We substitute our grayscale image for the L channel in the LAB space, then, then we are done. So, that's the every, everything we have in this process. But uh, you, find, you can see the, um, the result on the right can, 
um, shows you, can give you a better contrast preserving, um, comparing to the left ones. And here's another example. Um, you see the difference from the left to right. And uh, so in c to conclude this talk, actually, we have proposed a new color to gray scale, a method that can well maintain the color contrast. And uh, it's, uh, it's defines a weak color contrast. And uh, it is actually, we also propose polynomial mapping function. I think uh, it's not only useful for um, color to gray scale, maybe you can use it in other areas or other places. Um, yeah, I think that's it, thank you. Uh, if you go to your results, one of the results, it will be much more clear. Uh -huh. So let's say yellow becomes black, and that's... Uh, because it's relative, why we have, uh, why we have led this, our algorithm to choose the grayscale by itself, because we found actually that people, no matter what method we use, we cannot recover the color version image from the grayscale one. So basically, no matter what method you use, you cannot recover the color image. But uh, so the important thing is that you have to, especially for paper printing or, or the figure printing, you may need to say, oh, I don't really, when I, when I use a red rectangle to uh, enclose one character, maybe I don't care really much in, in the final grayscale version whether this red is, is black or, or white, but uh, I only want to see the contrast is large enough. So um, that's, that's so that our method just can give you such an illustration. For yeah, for natural images, you can actually, if you um, look at our, the very first, um, the very first example, you can actually notice there is no, uh, oh no, that's one, uh, next one, next page. Next page, right, this one. So. Actually, the, there's no influence on the natural images, basically, because natural images already gives you a uh, very nice representation. So you only need to, in general, only need to um, put in them into the combination. So, um, so that is also the advantage of our method, because we don't allow um, this parameter space wildly change. We only constrain them as a linear combination of a few predefined channels. Because these channels contains all the RGB, all the necessary structure information, so you won't give a, a wildly changed natural image. So that's so far, I think, it's not a, a issue in this framework. Yeah. 